Key. How's that sound? <laughs> Left my fear by the side of the road. Hear you speak, won't let you go. Fall to my knees as I lift my hands to pray. Got every reason to be here again. Father's love that draws me in. And all my eyes want to see is a glimpse of you. All I need is you All I need is you, Lord Is you, Lord All I need is you All I need is you, Lord Is you, Lord Just one more day one more day and it's not the same Your spirit calls my heart to sing Drawn to the voice of my Savior once again Where would my soul be without your Son? Gave his life to save the earth Rest in the thought that you're watching over me All I need is you All I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord. All I need is you. All I need. All I need 
holds the universe in his hands, every one of us. Oh, you hold the universe, you hold everyone on earth, you hold the universe. Me open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Won't you stand with me? We'll sing, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lift it up, to see you high and lift it up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love. As we sing, holy, 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 open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, oh, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, oh Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I lift it up to see you. I lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. Oh, pour out your power. 
we sing holy, holy, holy to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 as we sing holy, holy, holy. God, open my eyes to sing holy, 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 I want to see you. I want to see you hand lifted up. Here we go. To see you high and lifted up. In the light of your glory, oh, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, 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 I want to see you sing holy, holy, I want to see you. Holy, 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 I want to see you.
of your faithfulness. From east to west, and as deep, as deep it as it is wide, you know all our hopes, Lord. You know all our fears. Words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. Listen to our hearts, listen to our hearts. Hear our spirit sing A song of praise that flows From those you have redeemed We will use the words we know To tell you what an awesome God you are The words are not enough To tell you of our love So listen to us Words could fall like rain from these lips of mine. And if I had a thousand years, I would still run out of time. If you listen to my heart, every beat would say, Thank you for the life. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the way. Listen to our hearts. Listen to our hearts. Hear our spirit sing. A song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. Words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts.
know all our hopes. You know all our hopes. Lord, you know all our fears. Words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. Listen to our hearts. Listen to our hearts. Hear our spirit sing. Song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. Words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. Words are not enough to tell you of our love. So listen to our hearts. Please be seated. Thank you, Lord, that you listen to us. Thank you, Lord, that we can speak to you. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. Come, Holy Spirit, rest on us. Give us peace as we hear your word. And we give back to you with our tithes and offerings. We also pray, Lord, for the survivors and the families and friends of those who were lost <coughs> on the airliner this week. We know that <coughs> the country of Holland is in deep mourning. We ask you, Lord, to be with those people. Give them some peace and some understanding of your presence. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So good morning, everyone. Welcome. Lovely to see everybody. Chad, it's great to see Levina and the kids here with you. Welcome. And uh, if there are any other visitors, we're very happy to see you. And we love having visitors and hope that you will stick around and talk afterwards and meet our pastor and his wife. And uh, we, uh, we have connect cards that we would li like to have you fill out, but it's not 100% necessary. You can, if you like, to get onto our directory, and that way we'll get to know a little bit more about you and ask one of the ushers. So ushers, you may come forward and do your duty now. Eric and the ushers. During this, and I hope that we won't start this too soon because we might have to put the lights down a little bit, but there was a ladies' night out, apparently, and um, I've been told that, you know, what happened there was supposed to stay there. Um, but they allow us to see a little bit into their uh, event through a little video clip that they've prepared. So let's see that now. I am free from the law. Give them a clap. Lisa, Lisa put that together, I think, that little clip. She's getting good at that, yeah. By the way, we have communion on both sides of, this, of the uh, auditorium every Sunday, and we practice open communion. So if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to take communion at any time during worship or during the service or after. Uh, once a month we partake together, but normally you just go up there and prepare your heart and take communion, and you're welcome to do that. Now, we have a great conference coming up. I'm sure you haven't heard us talk about this before. It's called the Made for This Conference. And Costa Mitchell is coming all the way from South Africa to teach us for this weekend conference. We're having participation from other vineyard churches and various people from around. We're going to be streaming this live on the Internet. We're going to be making copies on DVD. It's going to be a wonderful time. Now, I know that Villard had explained to you how we're going to pay for this conference, and that is through uh, pledges and donations so that when the conference does arrive, that we will actually have it all paid for and people can come free of charge. Now it's time to pay up, okay? 
the, the, these are the, I'm putting my pledge in. I made a pledge, and I'm putting it in. The right way to do this is to get one of these little envelopes and fill out with a name on it and everything and how much you're giving and what it's for and give that to one of the ushers. So I'm putting mine in today just so that you all can see I'm doing it, and that means that you can do it too, okay, because we're going to need to pay for some things pretty soon. Now, next week at 9 o'clock in the morning here at the church, we're going to have a little training session for ushers and greeters. Now, I don't know if you know, but we do need people in this area, okay, especially in the greeting area. And uh, Joan said to something to me. She's in charge of greeting. She said something to me this morning. She said that <clears throat> you'd be surprised when you start doing these things how your spiritual life improves. And I think she's right. So if you're feeling like the Spirit is leading you to become an usher or a greeter, uh, we're going to have a training session next week, 9 a.m. It won't be long, maybe just a half an hour in the back room there. So show up early. There'll be kolaches and coffee ready for you when you get here. Um, next week on the Regency out, Outreach, we are looking for crayons and pens, I think. Uh, markers, colored pencils. You know that this Regency Outreach is going to happen on August the 13th at 6 p.m. And there's going to be a pizza tailgate party and we're going to be providing backpacks for all the children out there at the Regency Motel, the back to school type uh, things. Tammy told me to tell you that we don't need any more binders, you know, or notebooks. What we do need are pens and pencils. And really what you can do is go to the back table afterwards and see what's necessary for the upcoming weeks. This coming week we're asking for pens and pencils, then backpacks the following week. All right. Now, how many of you all remember Leave it to Beaver? Yeah? Well, we've got a treat for you this morning. Hey, Beaver, how much you got now? Six dollars and thirty-eight cents. Last week you had over seven dollars. Oh, I know. But each time I count it, it gets less. Well, then you better stop counting it. Then I won't know how much I'm losing. Beaver, how can you lose money just by counting it? Every time I look at it, well, I think of something I need. That's because you're a kid and you don't have any willpower. Yeah. Hey, Beave, as long as you got it out, phone me half a dollar. Uh-uh. Well, I'm really saving for that bike this time. Sure. But when are you going to get it? Someday, when I got enough money. Yeah. You know what I'll bet? What? I'll bet you keep counting it and counting it until it's all counted away. Then one day, you'll come home and you'll look in the drawer. There won't be anything in there but a dirty old sock. Well, we've come a long way since Leave it to Beaver, haven't we? Well, I want to do something very special. I want to pray for a plane. And we've been thinking about planes this week, haven't we? That's flying into San Salvador. And, uh, and two of our prominent members are on that plane. And I know uh, Kurt has an interest in this, but... Katie and Salem are flying in there. You know, many of you bless them, help them go, where they're flying in, basically should be hitting the ground just about right now, somewhere near. Uh, Kurt maybe can wave at us when he gets anything on his, you know, iPad or something. Say, yeah, they're there, they're there. So why don't we just bow our head and pray for them that this is going to be a great time. It'll change their lives forever. These, these trips are so powerful. Lord, thank you uh, for this opportunity for Katie and Salem, I pray blessings upon them right now as they have an opportunity to serve and be a part of ministry out there and they're going to learn so much and see so much and experience so much. And be, I pray they'll be able to bring it home and share it with us. And that it'll just be a great time, mother and daughter, experiencing so much together. Lord, I pray for their safety there. I pray for their safety coming home. And I pray blessings upon them. And please be with Kurt and the family here as they, you know, as they're batching by themselves. Thank you. Amen. I know they won't eat very good, so if y'all want to bring dumplings or something over, just feel free to do that. You could also bring a pot to our house, too, uh, anytime. I want to start by having you think about something. And uh, actually, I think I should pray first about this sermon, not just 
about Katie and Salem, but maybe we ought to pray because uh, how many of y'all, you'd uh, it, it turned the lights on, I, I want to see these hands. Uh, how many of you had a fight within the last 30 minutes with somebody? An argument? Oh, you think that's going to, oh, there's one brave soul. Yes, one brave person. Rest of you probably, about 10 of you lying out there somewhere. You know, okay, let's just give you another chance. How many here has had a fight, an argument, a conflict in the last day? Okay, we're getting a few more. There's about, if I counted it up, about seven or eight. I'm a pretty fast counter. Uh, how many of you had a fight, argument, conflict with somebody somewhere, someplace in the last week? That should get 99% of you, yeah. Okay, well, we got one over here holding out in the kind of a Salem dress, uh, uh, Salmon dress there, yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to go a little further. She hadn't had an argument or a conflict or anything in the last week. Is that what I said, week? Yeah. Okay, for the month. I got her, okay, that's all I wanted <laughs> to know. I wanted to know if, basically, that you're honest or not, you know? Uh, just to know if you're honest. Uh, we're going to go to a very important scripture in James 4, 1 through 12, uh, and uh, look at some conflicts that happen in people's lives, okay? Uh, I think what I want to do is, th this is, you know, a series we're doing in James. You can get it, it's archived if you, if you miss a sermon on James. James is the most practical book in the Bible. I hate the book. Uh, it, it's just, it's so, it's so judging, you know? It just, wow, I read it and I think, man, I'm messing up there, I'm messing up there, I'm messing up there. James is so gut level honest. I just want to go back to grace. How about you? Let's just go back to grace, you know, and uh, ask for forgiveness and just keep messing up and ask. James says, listen, if you're if you're a Christian, you, you need to make some changes in your life. Just don't go through life accepting that Christians act this way. And so he he really gets on our case. I'm sorry to tell you, he gets on our case. He's going to get on conflict case this morning and he's going to show us that that how we handle conflict is important now. Uh, this series, there's, I think there's three more messages in it, and they're powerful, like the next one's on wealth. Uh, matter of fact, everybody that comes next Sunday is going to get $100 just for coming, and uh, that's going to be in play money, but you'll get a real $100, okay. So don't miss next Sunday, because paper's going up, uh, it's getting more expensive. Okay, a road less traveled, I put in there, I changed that, uh, today most people go down the road more traveled. And that's the conflict route, and they handle it in the wrong way. So we're going to go to the next slide, and uh, there's three things I want you to look at here. First of all, Pastor James, who pastors the largest church in Jerusalem at that time, he uh, is telling us, you're going to have conflict. And I think, I think I got everybody to hold their hand up. That means you are basically honest people. Because if you hadn't held your hand up, you're a liar. And... Probably you got conflict deep inside that needs psychological help. I didn't say that. I mean, I just, you know, hinted to that. There's three things here, though. Number one, conflict because of worldliness. So you have conflict because something is happening in the worldly standpoint, which is dealing with desires. The other one is conflict handled in a godly way. Or conflict, James is saying, you're going to have it. So if you handle it from the way the world handles conflict, that's going to be one way. But he says you should handle it in the correct way. You should handle it in the way that God or Jesus would handle conflict. Is that possible? Well, that's why Jesus came to earth. Did you know that? To show us how to handle conflict. To show us how to live in the world and yet not be controlled by the world. So that's the way. Now some of you will want to go to number three. No conflict. Scratch that one out. It is not possible on this earth, and until Jesus comes, you're going to have conflict. So get ready, enjoy the ride. You're going to have conflict. Are you married? You, then you know. Then you know. Okay? You got kids? Then you know. They're teenagers? Wow. Yeah, you're just about to pull the rest of the hair out. I mean, it, you know what I mean. Conflict is part of life. I just ask you the question because that's the question the scripture is getting ready to go into. And I want to give you a definition of worldly. What is worldliness? Many times when you think of worldliness, you think of the world and spiritual. Well, in reality, 
worldly means the things that are, that, are, that are put together, organized, brought together in a way that causes Satan to be glad. Or actually what he's saying here is how we deal with the world, how we love the world, use the world, and how we let it uh, control our lives. It puts things together in a way that actually many times brings sadness to Jesus and happiness to the devil. So we handle the world in the wrong way, is what he's saying. But we've got to be in the world. Have you noticed that? There's only one way out of the world, and that's not an option today. You've got to stay in the world. So you need this message because these are what we would call natural desires or proclivities that we think are just normal for us. And most people think of the way to handle conflict from this worldly way. It's how we think. It's, it's, the, it's the rut. The rut in our brain. How many of you grew up in the country? You know, you, our ruts got so deep in the country that we had to split the ruts. Because if you stayed in the ruts, you'd drag high center. Sometimes when you're going with Christ, you've got to get out of the rut. And you've got to get on top of it. You've got to kind of say, that's, that's the way the world does it. Now I'm going to try to do it a different way. And that is the next slide, the road less traveled. Because we don't travel this road a lot. We like our worldly desires. Have you noticed how much we like them? We enjoy worldly desires. Did you know they're, they're somewhat natural, aren't they? I like nice things. I mean, I like nice cars. I even have a liking for computers. Uh, I enjoy my iPhone, even though it controls my life. My wife won't even talk to me anymore. She's on Facebook. Checking on all of y'all. And, you know, we're starting to work through this in our home. It's, it's a conflict right now, but we're starting to work through this Facebook thing. You know, we're starting to become one again. Literally, I'm not kidding you, it affects all of our lives, doesn't it? Your kids are on it. You know, they're sitting there at the di dinner table, you know, you know, sending texts, emails or something. They're looking at it at least. No, you don't let that happen in your home. Do y'all kids do that under the desk at school? Is that where you do it when you're at school? You do it down kind of low and teach you. To... Can you have uh, can you have iPhones in your classrooms at school? I mean, uh, was that possible? Yes. OK, that's good. OK. Uh, here's what you're going to see is. James is going to say your biggest problem, biggest problem is you just don't ask God for it. You don't ask God for it. You don't ask God to help. You don't ask God to be in it. For instance, we look at somebody that's maybe married and think, wow, I wish I had a husband or a wife like that. We're having problems. I wish I was married. I, why can't I find the right girl? Why can't I find the right guy? I wish. Or kids or, you know, wow, man, I wish my kids acted like that. Or I wish I had the kids. I wish we could have children. You see how all of this is a, these conflicts that are going on in our way. Think about jobs. Don't you look at people and say, man, I wish I had a job that made that kind of money. Whoa, you know. See, that, that's, that's inside of us. That's that pull. It's like, how did he get such a good looking girlfriend? He's ugly as spit. You know, how did he get her? You know, if he could get that girl, why can't I get somebody? Or boyfriend. Intellect. Oh, this one just kills me. You know, you're around these people that are smart, you know. And I think, God. You know, I could have used a little more. You know, I mean, it wouldn't have hurt just to drop a little more into me. And I, I hear God saying, if you just studied harder, you might have been smarter. I think it's all intellect up here. I studied hard. Car. Now, you may not want a car, but I envy pickups. Every time uh, a Tundra goes by me, especially black ones with silver trim on the bottom, and... Uh, I don't know, there's this kind of a greed jumps all over me. And uh, of course, I don't, I don't even listen to it. I just start thinking, how could I get that truck? 400 a month? Wow, that's a deal. Uh, I better go get one of those right now. Well, there's a conflict happens because I go home and I tell Diane, I want a Tundra. Think how I could use this, Diane. I can carry all that bedding for the flower beds home in the Tundra. I could get the fertilizer. And you know you want, you want that thing that makes holes in the yard? I could get that in the back of the tundra. There's a conflict developing here. 
Diane's over here on this side, and finally, what do I have to do? I have to say, God, please help me shut up. <laughs> you know, it's not going to work. Now, there are spiritual ways to handle these things. There are not spiritual ways to handle these, and that's kind of what we're going to show you. Let's go to James 4, 1 through 4. What causes fights, quarrels among you? That was the question we started with. Think back what you held your hand up. Some of you had it this last hour or two. Some of you had it in the week, month. What do you think caused that? Mine is a desire for a pickup. You know, you, you, what causes these? It's an over-desire for a pickup. It's a scheming desire for a pickup. So somewhere I have to identify what causes these quarrels amongst me. What causes people to divide and hurt? Now, James was a pastor, so don't, don't forget this. He knows what conflict is. He was in a large church, and where there's people, I don't know why it is, but where there's people, they have conflict. I, I don't know why that is. Do you? Have you figured that one out yet? Why? We're all perfectly wonderful people, but we keep having conflict. And it can be as simple as the color of a room to paint it or, you know, just what color this or little bitty things, you know, what you're having for breakfast or something. But what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. That's the step later on that you're headed to. <laughs> you haven't killed her yet, but, you know, you're thinking of him yet, you know. What you do is you use the tongue to kill. You slander, you talk, you say things, you, you go to a friend and you belittle. But it's still, it's still murder according to the Bible. You know that, don't you? If you have it in your heart, you know that kind of thing. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. James is talking about something that happens in here that's coming out. Let's go to the next slide. You do not have because you do not ask God. Now that's the last of verse 2. But he throws that kind of in the middle of these, these two part, this series right in here. He says, literally the problem is, you don't ask. You don't ask me. And you're going to find that God is actually saying, James is saying in the scripture, that God actually wants to be a part of your world. The question is, do you really want him to be a part of your world? Would you obey him if you let him into your world? And do you even ask him to be in your world? See, we get this image that God really doesn't want what we want. Or he's against what I want. If it's nice or if it's too costly or this. That he doesn't want us to have it. Well, maybe that's true. But that's not what I'm reading in the word. I'm reading that he loves me and he wants good things for me. He wants to actually bless me. And next Sunday you'll see more about that in the Sermon on Wealth. When you ask, you do not receive, though, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Or he's saying, Villard, you want the Tundra pickup. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, you could settle for a used one. Oh, God, that's, I don't know. They don't have the same new technology in them. See? Uh, see, we, we want... See, we want things, but we can Now, what if I'm, what if I'm needing a, a car, a pickup? Sure. I go to God and say, God, you know, I really do need a vehicle. I mean, I really do. Some of y'all really need some things at home. You really need this. You, maybe it's uh, you need some work at house done, or you need the house painted, or you need a new car, or you need a, a car. You need, you need some things, real things. You know what I mean? Why don't we say to God? With your wife, with your friend, with with leaders, with people in the church, with, and, and say, you know, I want to pray about this because we're really needing this in our home. We really need this in our life. We really need it. Okay, God, I really do need a pickup. Now, where you get in trouble is I start putting all my flesh in there trying to figure out what kind of pickup I want, and it seems like it always goes beyond what I really need. It always gets way out there. And that's where we charge too much getting in debt over our heads because why we're asking god but our heart is not yielding to god maybe god wants me to have it he may even want me to have a tundra i'm hoping but would i listen to him if he gave me something else i don't know that's the battle that goes on inside of us that's what's going on here's here's a thought as i go to the next slide how we get something and how we use it has everything to do 
with what it is. For instance, how I get it. Did I cheat, steal, lie, use my tithes and offerings? Did I use somebody else that I should have helped next door first? Did I pull that? What did I do to get that? Did I have to pay somebody at work less than they should have gotten and didn't give them a bonus and they worked extra hard? You know, what did I do to get that? And when I got that, how did I use it? You know, I wished every one of y'all owned vans and uh, Tahoes. Is that what? Tahoes? Tahoes? I hadn't said a joke in quite a while, so I thought I'd throw that in. Sub, what is it? Suburban? Yeah. I like Suburbans too. Big. See, I want every one of you to have one of those things because, see, as God blesses us with people out there, listen, this Regency thing is not a small thing. Uh, God wants to touch a lot of people in this city. And listen, I, I, don't, I, don't, want to, I don't want to scare you. God loves hurting people more than he loves you. He really does. God said, oh, you got 99 sheep? Heck, they're okay. Go get the one that's missing. Oh, you, you got most of the coins? Go get the one that's missing. He gave three illustrations to say the people in the fold, I'm not as worried about those as those out there. Listen, as he does that, there's going to be many needs that start coming into the church. And either we will serve those needs or we won't, and it'll be our desires. It's going to be right here where this sermon's at. It's going to be what this is all about. How we get something, and you know, if you've got that suburban, and you've got that van, and you're going to pick up people that can't get here, and then finally you get to know those people, what are you doing? You're connecting with them. You get to know them. That's a dangerous thing, friends, right there. You get to know people, and guess what? Then God will begin to convict you. Why don't you... Do more with them. Why don't you help them? Why don't you uh, take them out? Maybe see how we could get a job for them. See what we could do. All of a sudden, see you're connecting. And now they're coming to church. They're coming and they're, they're, wanting, they're wanting to grow in their life. And God begins to touch them. They begin transformed. And all of a sudden, there's still needs in their life, though. They're still struggling through marriage situations or relationships. And so where are they looking? They're looking to a church that says, we care. Help me. And if the church doesn't help them, there's two people very sad, the people out there in God. Two people very sad. And you know why? Because we were too busy with our own needs. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm not trying to say anything there. I'm just saying we've got to start thinking this way because we've got to move. Forward. How you get something and how you use it, you can't get anything cheating, lying, stealing. And then when you get it, how are you using it? What is it for? What would be the blessing of this or the benefit to it? It's something we have to think about. Okay. You idolatrous people, wow, James, why did you have to be so honest with us? I mean, why didn't you just say it out front where we get it? He says, you idolatrous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity, enmity against God? You're, it's, 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 a, it's warring against him. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. James, why didn't you just say it plain so we'd get it? You can't miss that, can you? Yeah, you can. You can just get up, leave, and go on your way. After the service, you know, forget it. We can look in mirrors all day, can't we, and never realize how ugly we are. I hate looking in the mirrors. I look at my eyes when I look in a mirror. You know why? I don't like all the wrinkles. I remember this guy with nice hair. Then I got married. Tell you, man. We look at the mirror and then we take off and we forget. That's what James t tells us. You adulterous people, he's saying your hearts are divided. You don't even know your heart is divided, but it is. And that's why, you know, that's what the word is. It's a two edged sword. It comes and it cuts, and we say, oh, that hurts. And God says, I know, because see, there's something that needs to be cut out. Something you have to deal with. There's something you, you've got to, got to let go of in your life. 
And so that's what he's trying to tell us here. Now, I want you to remember something very important right here. I want you just to stop in your mind, come back to me. You're, you're mad at me already and you're ready to go home and you're tired of this straight talk from calling you an adulterous people. But it's good for somebody to yell at you every once in a while. Once a week at least. But come back to this. You will have conflict. Don't ever believe that you can get by without having conflict. Conflict is going to be a part of your life. You cannot help but have conflict. And if you don't have conflict, here's what people do. And you may have done this already. You may not want to be in a community group because of this. See, when, when we have conflict, it hurts. We don't like conflict, so what do we do? We retreat and we isolate. And then we'll only pick the people that we agree with or that won't con confront us or really deal with reality the way it is. We retreat. We isolate. Sometimes people get to the point they will have no relationships. No relationships, no conflict. Did I tell you at the beginning that you couldn't choose point number three? Did I tell you that was not an option? See, that's living in, uh, that's living in heaven and you're not there yet. Your parents probably, my parents did not have conflict in front of me, but I never really saw them really getting along in front of me, either one. It's kind of like they lived their two worlds. I think they loved each other. I'm not really sure. I'll ask mom when I get to heaven. I'll ask dad when I get to heaven. I'm hoping they're doing better up there than they did down here. See, I believe that, that we have to, if you're in a home where there's lots of conflict, lots of talking, lots of arguing, and Diane and I do it quite a bit. Don't stay with us all week. We'll get too relaxed. But listen, if you've been in a home like that, then you may never want to get married. You may never want to be in real. You may not. You say, well, I'm not going to get married because, I mean, see, when you don't get married, you can get out of a relationship quicker that way. Oh, it's not working. I'm out of here. See, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Because, see, we're scared of conflict. We grew up in a home where there's conflict. See, friendship equals, listen to this, friendship equals conflict and pain. <laughs> Write it down. It's there. If you want friendship, you're going to have conflict and you're going to have pain. Now, I'm not saying it's always like that. Every day of the week has to be like that. Every minute of your life has to be like that. But sometimes it seems that way, doesn't it? It seems like there's a whole bunch of it. But see, when you think about handling this in, next slide, conflict handled in a, gut, a godly way. Excuse me. <clears throat> in a godly way. So there is a way to handle conflict that doesn't blow us away. Or... Don't let the desires of my flesh, which is I'm right, they're wrong. You know, I'm more important than they are. See, it's pulling me away. It's wanting me to handle this situation in a, a worldly way, a fleshly way. And if you handle it this way, and Jesus was a good example. James 4, let's start at verse 5. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealous, jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Now, just stop right there for a moment. He, he is jealous for the spirit that is in us. What James is saying here, he wants to be a part of your life. Every part of your life. It's hard to understand that. But in, the, in any time in your life, he's right there saying, invite me. Let me be a part of that. See, sometimes we, we actually, this is the world's way of thinking, we want to do it on our own. We're afraid that if we ask God, you know, didn't you ever have that? If, if I asked Diane, Diane if I could buy uh, that tundra, what is she going to say? No. So I better just go do it and then tell her about it and repent. <laughs> but I don't want to die, so I'm not going to do that. But uh, the, the truth of it, it's better to say I'm sorry than it is to get advice up front. And exactly God is saying that. Many times you want forgiveness, and forgiveness, yes, I'll give, but you'll suffer for what you did. You'll suffer for the things you did here and didn't have the right decision. It was fleshly. So what, what Jesus is saying here, invite me in to every situation as fast as you can. Start in the morning with a little bit of prayer. Start in the afternoon with a little bit of prayer. Stop in the middle of the day with a little bit of prayer. And every time you face something, say, Jesus, send your Holy Spirit. I need some help right now. Three minutes later, God, would you send more Holy Spirit? I need some more help right now. 
And God, I know it's only been five minutes, but would you send some more of your Holy Spirit because I need some help. That's us. And did you know there's angels in heaven getting excited? There's one of my children down there that wants dad involved. There's one of my children that can't wait to say help. There's one of my children that's saying, come Holy Spirit, and I sent him down there for one reason. I sent the Holy Spirit to be a comforter, a guide, a counselor, and they're using him in their life. That's what that scripture is saying. See, when you're living in the worldly conflict, you're venting emotions. You're venting feelings. And God may be weeping. The, the answer is to go the road less traveled. Jesus had conflict, didn't he? Didn't Jesus have conflict? I mean, how do you think about this one? Just, let's just pull out one or two. He says to Peter, Satan, get behind me. I don't know, Michael, if you're just walking with me and we was talking, I said, Satan, get behind me. <laughs> I, was, I was going from a house over to the bank, which is now Capital Bank, and I was moving from that house over to the bank. We were staying in that home right there beside it when I first moved it to Brenham. And I was heading over there, and there was this guy standing by, which is now Capital Bank, and he was standing there, and he, he looked at me, and he said, Stop! That's what I did. I took two more steps. He said, Stop! You know, what's going on? Sure enough, there was a dog behind me. I'll tell you, though, he was convincing me to stop. I mean, I was sure I was going to stop, man. It was getting, that was serious, you know, because I didn't know what was happening, see? I, I didn't know if, who was, what was going on, and I, I thought, wow, I don't know where that fit in the message, but it's a good story. Um, see, the truth of it is, the truth of it is, Jesus knew how to handle conflict, didn't he? Jesus knew how to deal with it, because here's Peter, he's saying, get behind me, Satan, Here's a mob of people getting ready to throw him off the cliff. Here's Pharisees and Sadducees, and they're on his case like, you know, what is it, ducks on a June bug. I mean, they're pecking the heck out of him. They're just coming at him from all directions. And Jesus was able to answer and answer and answer and answer. Guess how he was doing that? By his great intellect? No. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's why he spent some time alone. Maybe that's why he went out early in the morning and talked to the Father. Maybe it's why he took the Sabbath day off. Maybe it's why he prayed and, and studied. Maybe that's why, because he believed he needed help. He relied upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, God gives grace to the humble. I want to go to verse 6. When people are in, when people are in conflict... They want grace, don't they? We, when people are having conflict, they want grace. But too often they're prone not to give grace when you need it. So there's this equal sharing of grace. But he gives us more grace. Maybe I'm in the wrong one there. Verse, I'm sorry, I didn't finish up, did I? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Now you see how this is all coming together? So the person that knows God wants to be a part of this situation, he's in a situation, she's in a situation, things are not going too well. But that person that comes and says, uh, you know, let me hear what you said again. They, or they shut up. They quit arguing. They say, you know, go over that again and, and let me hear, I didn't quite understand. Is this what you said? Let me know more about what you're saying here. Explain it. What are you doing? You're trying to find a way to understand because, see, it's not about us always. It may be about them. It may be something they need from us or we need to get involved. God is saying, if you'll call out to me, I'll give you wisdom. He says, if you'll call out to me and not respond in flesh, not act in flesh, not go by the tundra pickup like that, if you'll respond and ask me to be a part of it, I will give grace to you. I'll give grace to you. Which means he will come into my life and help me and give me peace and joy and happiness. And I will live today in a much better way than you will. Because I'm living in grace. I'm living in peace. He's coming. He's saying, I'm going to give you 
grace. And he's going to say here that he opposes the proud. He goes right in Proverbs 3.34 is what he quotes down at the bottom. God opposes the proud. I can work this out. I can make this happen. I'll go straighten this out with that person. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to make this happen. You know, I'm, 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 I'm able to do this. God opposes that person. See, aren't we taught that way, though, in our society? Be strong, be powerful, be confident, push on over people that won't move out of the way. You know, just go for it, man. This is America. You can do anything. You can, if you just believe enough, if you're just confident enough. Well, I don't see that in Scripture. I see it saying, humble yourself. It doesn't mean that you don't get things done. It doesn't mean that you're not confident. But you're confident enough to slow down. You're confident enough to listen to people. You're confident enough to listen to the Holy Spirit and not be in a hurry. You're confident enough in the Lord Jesus Christ that He will get you through this situation and He'll make you a winner. Even though the winner may not be that money you wanted to make or that job you wanted. You know, oh, I want that job up there and you're going for that job. I'm going to get that job. Did you, did you think about stopping and saying, God, I really need a better paying job? You may have to humble yourself. You may have to wait. You may have to trust God. You may have to believe. You may have to just pray for a while until God opens the door. But there's things you might be able to do. But God says, I oppose the proud, but I show favor to the humble. See, pride is actually saying things like this, isn't it? I am important. I'm more important than him. I'm better, really, than that person. God, you should help me because look at what all I do. I'm really a better person. Or maybe, here's where I'm at, I'm, I'm just usually right. I can't help it. I know what's best for you if you just listen to me. Don't, don't say that to your wife. We should be saying, how could I help this situation and not destroy it? Humility. Humility how did, what does humility look like? How does it, when you think about humility, how does, it, how does it look? Well, in verse 7, you actually see an answer to this somewhat. Submit yourselves then to God. Humility is not, not accepting things necessarily the way they are. It's not, not believing and believing strongly, but it's submitting yourselves to higher power. It also may mean getting with somebody that you trust, that's, you know, been down the road a year or two longer. You submit to authority. You submit to people that might can help you. That's humility. Humility is saying, I might be wrong. I could be wrong. And so I'm going to check with people. I'm going to get some information. I'm going to invite God into this situation. I'm going to, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to guide me. Because guess what it says here? says, resist the devil. What's, what's going on? I want to do it my way. I want it done today. I want this. I want that. It's resist the devil. Resist those desires, those emotions, and he will f flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, or you people that don't believe God's going to do this. It's just not in your, out there in your horizon. You need to wash your hands, and you need to realize God loves you. He died for you. He gave everything He had for you. He came to earth just for you. He went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit just for you. I mean, you got a good deal. You ought to go for it, hadn't we? We shouldn't miss this deal that God's giving. So He says, wash your hands. Become, become a Christian. Don't be a, a talking Christian and an acting atheist. That's where many Christians are. They talk Christianity, but they act like atheists because they don't bring God into the situation. So he says, come near to God, and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify you hearts, you double-minded. He's saying so many Christians have not accepted what I'm telling them today. He says, that's what James is saying. He says they're double-minded. That's that idolatrous type, uh, adultery type uh, attitude that's in people's lives. Verse 9, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. You know, sometimes you'll hear people, they'll say, Man, I got that job. I got it. Man, oh, oh, so-and-so wanted it, but I got it, man. I mean, I had, I had to go in there and really butter up the boss. So, but I got it. I got it, man. I, you know, you hear that, and you kind of like, 
And he's excited, isn't he? He's able to just go up that ladder and just kick somebody off on the way up. And maybe he didn't. But, I mean, you just feel this attitude. He's excited. And he didn't really care what happened. He didn't really care. He, he wanted that job. See, what you're seeing there is you're seeing that he says, you, if you're acting that way, you ought to be grieving. He says you ought to be mourning. You ought to be wailing. You ought to be changing your laughter and your glee about how well you're doing and saying, wait a second. Am I doing this in a godly way? Am I living this life in a godly way? Or am I just doing it according to my flesh and calling myself a Christian and going home and praising God that I got the job even though I murdered two or three people on the way up? I had to slander them a little bit. I had to tell a little untruth and I just didn't tell anything on this other person, you know, because I knew the truth. You know, I, I, I kind of moved things around so I could get that job. He says, number, number 10, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Or he's saying, invite me into these situations. There's something more at stake here than getting a job or getting something done or accomplishing something or doing something. He says, there's so much more at stake here. Humble yourself. And let me be in. Or what he's saying is stop talking and be quiet and listen. Resist those desires to prove yourself and what you think is right. Start to think about how God or Jesus would handle this situation. Grieve that you're letting the fleshly desires control you. Weep over these things in your life. Come to God and say, God, break my heart for people. Break my heart for the people I work with and don't work with. Break my heart. Help me not to judge them. If there's conflict, help me to never be glad that I'm winning. Help me to always seek a way to help the other person. See, sometimes we're just worshiping our own desires. What is it that honors God? What is it that would bring glory to Him in what I'm doing? That's what James is saying. You should be thinking about what would bring glory, what would bring honor. That's why he's saying, wash your hands. Quit, quit dealing with life in this fleshly way and start dealing with life in this spiritual way. This is a road less traveled, isn't it? I'd just rather go with the flesh, personally. It feels good to just say things, you know what I mean? Just, ah, he's a jerk. It just feels good, doesn't it? Because, see, our flesh is prone to go this way. But I think with all my heart, God is saying, begin to love the road less traveled. Did I do anything wrong in this situation? Did I say something too quickly? Should I have not said that? Should I have done this in a different way? Lord, should I wait on this job and not even apply for it at this time? Should I not? What do you, what do you think, Holy Spirit? Guide me here. And you just feel this little bit of a urgency maybe to move forward. Or you feel this little bit of like, you know, you need to talk to some other people involved. Oh, God, I, I just want it your way. I want it what, the way you'd want me to do it. We'll finish with verse 11. And I'm not going to even give you the whole one. It's a lot. But here's the gist of this whole thing. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sister. Now, if you want to read less of that, I will. Because of time, I'm going to stop right there. I knew this might be getting a little long at that point. But here's what this is saying. In this whole last few verses, through verse 13, through verse 12, he is saying, you don't know the motives of people's hearts. And so don't try to figure those motives out. Haven't you always heard, haven't you heard this? You know, uh, I don't think she likes me. I don't think he likes me. You know, in the church, you know, I go home and I'll, I'll, I'll be thinking about all of y'all and I'll think, you know, I think they're mad at me. You know, because I don't know, when they shook my hand, they just didn't look at me. You know how you can start analyzing that sort of thing? And inside, so you're judging their motives. Now, we're not talking about outright sin. Now, you know, if you're out there killing somebody right now with a gun, I'm going to say, that is sin, brother, and you need to quit it. Put that gun up. Save it for, you know, the real bad people. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean. You know, I'm, I'm a, I believe in guns, so okay. Uh, yes, I killed an armadillo last night, too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I killed him. You know, I love seeing those dudes die. I'll just tell you, just humanly down inside, I had to pray for forgiveness. I loved it so much. After he tears up flower bed, after I've spent hours on that stupid flower bed, and then he comes in and just tears it up.
I mean, just because they hurt you, they tear up your flower bed, and they mess your life up, you don't want to blow them away. Yeah, you do. No, you don't. Yeah, you do. No, you don't. You go with the heart of God. God, I need your help to love this person. How can I do more for them? How can I serve this person? How can I be on the right side of this situation? Well, that's what he's saying here. You begin to judge the motives of people. You begin to figure out what you think people think or what they're doing. Oh, I saw him do that, and I, th I know why he did that. I know why he did No, you don't. You don't know that. So I want to finish by just giving you a few thoughts that uh, I think the next slide will bring up. For instance, I'm going to talk about the fact that, oh, he bought a car. He shouldn't have bought that car. I know why he bought that car. Because he wanted a nicer one than my car. No, you don't know that. Well, he shouldn't have bought it. It was too expensive and he can't afford it. How do you know that? His grandpa may have given him $50,000. And it's none of your business anyway. Now, I'm going to check and see if he tithed on it. But, I mean, it's none of my business, really, is it? See, we judge them up. Friends, if his friends knew what I know, they might not be so friendly with him. You see, I'm judging the motives there. No, he, he may have friends and he may be honest with those friends. I mean, you can't figure these things out is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I know how he got that job. He sucked up to the boss. That's how he got that job. He really, I mean, he really, he, he took him out to eat every day. Did you know what? It isn't a bad idea to get to know your boss. Did you know that? It's not wrong to get to know your boss. Matter of fact, you'd be smart to take your boss out to eat. I'm just telling you some good advice. If you don't know your boss, and if he doesn't know you, it's hard for him to move you up. See? He, he might get to know you over lunch, and he may say, man, I kind of like this guy. Friends, that is not cheating. People would be wise to do that. Because, see, relationships are so important. But now, if you judge that guy that's eating with the, the boss, buying lunch for him, you're saying, I know what he wants. He just wants that job. Maybe not. Maybe he doesn't want the job that you want. Maybe he just wants to know the boss so he can find a way to serve in that business correctly. Maybe his motive was as pure as gold. Maybe he even said to the boss, you know, I know you're wanting to give me a, do this, and I know it's a big raise, but he says, you know what? I really think I can do you a better job serving over here. I heard that from my son-in-law just the last few weeks. I heard him talking about those type of things, and I said, that's godly. That's godly what he's doing. He wants to serve that company. He's just not wanting to get rich. So I close with 25 points. <laughs> I'm sorry, I hate to finish this up quickly. As for more and more of the Holy Spirit. Will you do that? I'm not kidding, you can't do it too much. This guy, I mean the Holy Spirit can't wait to be a part of your decisions. You just don't know how much you are. See, you want, your flesh is telling you he doesn't care, but he does. It's because you're wanting something, and he's not, he's not agreeing with you at the moment. He's saying, wait, no. And you don't like those two answers. Be humble. Be willing to be honest with yourself. That's where I've got to on this Tundra pickup. It's going to have to be a used one. I can see it now. Paint job. Okay. Submit to godly friends. What do you see in me? Ask them, hey, did I handle that wrong? Did I handle that right? Godly friends are one of your best ways to know what the Holy Spirit is doing. Humble yourself. These are all submitting and humbling. Number, the next slide, accept that conflict is going to happen. Don't try to run from it. Conflict is going to happen. What does that do for you? It doesn't mess your day up when you have some conflict. When you and your wife scream at each other, hop, didn't, we're not going to get a divorce. Hey, we can make it through one or two screams. Four or five. Five thousand. We'll make it. I, I'm not kidding. You'll make it. Okay, what are desires you feel you feel pushing you are things pushing you and you can feel them pushing you I hate to keep bringing this up, but that's that that's that tundra thing Now y'all don't be worried about it. You know if you see me drive up a new tundra, you know, I don't know Something may have happened You know, we may have sold the house and moved into an apartment or something, but What are the desires pushing you do you find? yourself daydreaming about having someone else what someone else has you kind of find man i wish i had that i man, why did they get that why can't i you need to stop that right now pray and ask god for it but be willing to check your reasons for wanting it
pray and ask God. It is not a bad thing. Whatever you want, whatever desire, whatever dream, whatever ambitions, ask God. And then say, God, I humble myself. Guide me, direct me. Do you run from conflict? How many times have you just run from conflict? You, you got scared. You, got, you didn't want to face it. Listen, you got cheated because God wanted to do something as you went through that conflict. Do you feel unworthy to have nice things? Big thing in my life. Years went by. Felt so unworthy to ever have anything nice. Ever have anything. Still somewhat feel guilty that at times. Always felt guilty about growing up. It's because I, I had this poor type mentality. It took me forever. And you know what? I met some what I would call godly rich people. And it turned me totally around. They were godly rich. I'll talk about that next Sunday. They loved God with all their heart. They were hugely generous to the kingdom. Godly rich. And it turned me around and realized, hey, it's okay to want some nice things. Do you find yourself judging others? Stop it. <laughs> I know you're going to do that because I told you to. Would you stand with me? Dear Lord, we're all in conflict. We're living in a world that's filled with conflict. We're living in a body that's, uh, that's fallen under sin. We're all desiring things. We want things. Here we are, God. We just give our lives to you right now. We just come to you and say, God, we're so human. We're so n normal. Here we are. But Lord, this morning in our hearts, we're choosing to go the road less traveled. We're choosing to decide to go down this path to make godly decisions. We're choosing this, Lord. You're going to see us vacillate at times, Lord. You're going to see us want to go this way or that way. You're going to see the struggle in our hearts. But Lord, help us. Come, Holy Spirit. Talk to us at that moment. Please help us. Because, Lord, we want to be your children. We want to be Christians that act like Christians. We want to be Christians that look like Christians. We want to be Christians that don't just talk about faith, but our works prove it. That's what we want to be, Lord. That's what we want to be. And Lord, I pray that you'll send us out to be those people in the midst of a world that's filled with desires and flesh and worldliness. And it's, it's on every side. But Lord, we can be in that world and we can live a godly life right there in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we close, some may go have communion. They start some music somewhere in this building and we may have communion. People may be getting prayer. People may need to come and ask God to touch them or invite him into a situation of their life. Lord, may this be a time that nobody feels judged or condemned, but opportunity to get prayer, to get help, to get encouragement. And Lord, then as we go into the world, guide us this week. May it be one of the best weeks, the best weeks as we handle life by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Diane, I'll be over here. Uh, if you need...